When Matt Walsh was on the Dr. Phil show a couple of months ago, he asked other guests the question, what is a woman? And they couldn't answer. It's like, what is a woman? Well, Can you tell me what a woman is? No, I can't. And it was out of that interaction that the inspiration for his new documentary came. Now, since everybody's been talking about it, I finally got a chance to watch it. And here are a few of my thoughts from a Christian perspective and also what I think that we can learn from his conversations. First, let's talk about the first half of the film, and then we'll talk about the last half. So as expected, after the opening scenes, Matt starts interviewing people, and he starts asking them questions about trans ideology and what a woman is. He is a woman. Can you tell me that? <laughs> well, you're at the Women's March. You must have some idea. Now, he interviews a lot of different people, ranging from people on the street to activists to social scientists to physicians and so on. Now, with Matt being a conservative commentator, clearly he wanted to expose the logical issues of the trans ideology. But one thing that I noticed about how he did so early on is what I found interesting. He chose to do so almost exclusively by just asking questions. In his interviews, I can't think of very many times where he even made an argument for his position. Instead, he only asked people questions and then sat back and watched them spin trying to come up with an answer. One of his purposes in doing so was obviously to get his audience to see the incoherence in his opposition's views without having to explicitly tell them that they're wrong. Now, this isn't a bad tactic, and Jesus actually used a similar method during his ministry. Jesus would ask people questions, and not to win battles or to make them look stupid, or even to win the applause from the crowd. But instead, when it comes to Jesus, he would ask people questions so that way the people listening would gain more insight into the question behind the question. Now, there's plenty of examples of this throughout the New Testament, a lot of them. But one that comes to mind is when Jesus was with the people who thought he was casting out demons by the power of Satan. And so Jesus said to him, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. And that's when Jesus asked the question of, how then can his kingdom stand? Now, one thing that I love about how Jesus asked questions was the fact that he asked them in a way where the conclusion wasn't forced onto the listener. And instead, he would frame the questions in a way where the hearers could wrestle with the question and then come to the conclusion in a way where they could appreciate it as something that they discovered themselves. In doing this, Jesus didn't create a dynamic where it was him versus the listener, but instead, he created the dynamic where it was the listener versus themselves. This is one of the many reasons why Jesus was so brilliant in how he handled his opposition. Now, when it comes to how Matt asked asked his questions. He also did a great job in asking some really good questions, but if I had to offer a critique, there's one thing that I think that he could have done better. Now, even though I thought Matt was doing a good job by asking some really good questions, I wasn't convinced that the people who were being interviewed were even able to understand what the core issue with their position was. They knew that they couldn't answer his questions, but I don't think that they understood why or what the real problem was. The reason why they couldn't, at least it seems to me, is because Matt would often frame his questions in terms of logical categories and would attempt to show them the absurdity in their position by showing them the logical consequences that followed from their position. Now, don't get me wrong, this isn't always a bad move, but I don't think that it works in cases like these. So for example, watch how he frames his question in this clip. Have you ever met a four-year-old who believes in Santa Claus? Mm -hmm. So this is someone who believes that a fat man is traveling through the sky on a flying reindeer at lightning speed, coming down his chimney with presents. Yeah. Would you say that this is someone who maybe has a tenuous grasp on reality? They have an appropriate four-year-old handle on the sure. reality Agreed. that's very real for them. Agreed. Agreed. But Santa Claus is real for them, but yeah. Santa Claus is not actually real. Yeah, well, and, but Santa Claus does deliver their Christmas presents. Well, yeah, but he's not real, though. To that child, they are. When I see a child who, you know, believes in Santa Claus, and then let's say this is a boy and he says, I'm a girl. Mm -hmm. This is someone who can't distinguish between fantasy and reality, so how could you take that? as a reality? I would say that as a pediatrician and as a parent, I would say how wonderful my four-year-old and their imagination is. So as you just saw, Matt compared kids making the decision about their sexual identity with believing in Santa Claus as a way to highlight the fact that kids aren't capable of making serious decisions about their gender identity. The intent of his question was to expose the absurdity of her views by showing her the logical consequences that followed from her views. Now again, this approach is great and it often works, but in my experiences, it doesn't work on issues that a person doesn't arrive at as a result of strict logic. I don't think that it was necessarily logic that drove this lady to her conclusions. Instead, it was probably empathy or more of an emotional path. 
If the path that the lady took to come to her conclusion was emotional, then rather than Matt trying to show the absurdity by showing her the logical consequences that follow from her position, he would have been far more effective by showing her the emotional consequences that follow from her position. But that's something that I think he did a much better job of in the next part of the movie. The next part of the movie shifted over to interviews from people who have been negatively impacted by our culture's current trans ideology. I thought it was at this point that Matt's position seemed far more emotionally compelling. He starts by interviewing a girl who was an elite track runner, and she tells a story about how she lost out on receiving medals or qualifying for being recruited by colleges because two trans athletes dominated all of the races every year at her high school. What I thought made the portion of this movie even more compelling was the fact that the girl being interviewed didn't come across as having a political agenda that she was trying to get across. She just told the real life emotional impact that trans athletes have had on her life and how it negatively affected and impacted her future. So I thought that this was an example of showing the consequences of the ideology emotionally rather than logically, which I think would be far more effective to the majority of the people who hold to a trans ideology. Next, he interviewed a biological woman who transitioned into a male at a young age. And this person was extremely upset with the idea of putting kids on puberty blockers and allowing them to transition because this person says that this was their experience and it led to all kinds of negative consequences in her life. They talked about how now they have these medical issues and they don't think that they're going to live a long time. And all of it, they think, is because of the fact that they were put on these puberty blockers and these transitioning drugs. Rather than comparing things logically, as he did with most of the other interviews in the first half of the documentary, here he was comparing things emotionally. And so in doing so, he was more so speaking their language. So I think that Matt was more effective when he pointed out the issues from his opponents by arguing from emotional categories rather than logical ones. Once again, think back to Jesus. When we see Jesus showing people the absurdities in their position, he seems to keep the categories the same in the eyes of the listeners. When he was talking to the Jews, he showed them the absurdities by referencing the scriptures that their criticisms of Jesus were based on. This is why we read how Jesus left his hearers amazed after his questions and his arguments. In the second half of the film, he used arguments that were more emotional in nature and they were able to invoke a sense of empathy. And emotion and empathy are two things that drive a lot of people's views on these issues in the first place. But overall, I thought that the documentary was done pretty well and from from a Christian perspective, I think that we can take the good and the bad. One of the good things that we can take away from Matt's interviews is learning how to ask good questions that draw deeper issues for people to discover on their own. But as a word of caution here, and I'm not saying that this is Matt's goal, but one thing that we shouldn't do is ask these questions for the sake of making the other person look dumb or just to win a debate. Our end goal should always be to persuade rather than to punish. As Christians, we're called to love everyone, including our enemies. And part of that means helping them to see their errors, but doing so in a way that they can understand and be receptive to. But all of this is just my perspective. Go ahead and let me know yours down below. But the next time that you find yourself asking yourself, what is a woman? What are you gonna say? What do you mean?